Greetings. I am Jerice Stroud, Project Director for our Indie Epidemic Initiative for the Satcher Hub Leadership Institute and Morehouse School of Medicine. It is my esteemed honor to welcome you to our webinar series, Policy Implications and Recommendations to Promote Healthier Outcomes for People Living with HIV in the South. This series examines the structural barriers that exist within Black communities in the Southern United States regarding HIV testing, treatment, and ongoing care. Today's featured webinar, In the Epidemic, Challenging Assumptions and Advancing Modernization, is in recognition of HIV is not a crime awareness day. Through our discussions, we aim to discuss the pervasive stigma surrounded or associated with HIV, highlight common misconceptions about HIV transmission, and separate the facts from the myths in addition to the legal and human rights implications of HIV criminalization. We also aim to examine the intersectionality of HIV with other social and political determinants of health. Thank you for joining us for this deserving conversation. We look forward to a robust discussion with our panelists today, along with action-oriented strategies to advance health equity for our community members that are impacted by the structural barriers relative to HIV. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to a wonderful discussion. Welcome to this integral, important conversation. I'm Mandisa Moore O'Neill and my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I have the pleasure of moderating this important conversation in the epidemic, challenging assumptions and advancing modernization. I am the executive director of the Center for HIV Law and Policy, and let's just get right into it. Now, on this day of HIV criminalization, Awareness Day, I think it's important to start with the question, can you tell us what HIV criminalization is and why is it such a pivotal issue, especially for Black communities? And to start with, I would like Mr. Ernest Brown, Ms. Sally Thomas, and Dr. Cedric Pulliam to please introduce yourselves and to answer this question. I can go, I can start us. Uh, my name is Sally Thomas, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the HIV decriminalization specialist at Positive Women's Network. Um, HIV criminalization to me is the criminalization of activities of people living with HIV that would otherwise be legal. Um, so, the first like HIV criminalization laws came about around 1986. And that was a time when like, very little was known about transmission. Very little was known about treatment. There wasn't uh, the same treatment that we have today. And in, in order for the states to receive funding, uh, federal funding to combat HIV, they were required to have HIV criminalization laws on the books. Uh, but those laws are still intact in several states. And although science has advanced in a way that um, makes these laws completely just irrelevant. Um, many of the laws that criminalize behavior are criminalizing behavior that poses low to no risk for HIV exposure. And they don't account for uh, the prevention measures such as condom use or antiretroviral viral medication regimens or uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis or um, also known as PrEP. Um, antiretroviral viral medications allow persons with HIV to reach viral suppression, thus making, it, making them unable to transmit HIV via sex. And PrEP is a pill taken by folks who are not living with HIV to prevent transmission um, and reduces their chance of requiring HIV by 99%. Um, most criminalization laws don't require intent to transmit nor actual transmission of HIV. Um, rather than HIV criminal laws being reserved for cases where there is intentional transmission, um, Laws essentially criminalize the person 
just based on the mere fact that they're in Muslim with HIV. And I can pass it to Cedric if you have more to add. Yes, thank you so much, Sally. And thank you, Mendisa, for moderating this amazing conversation. My name is Cedric Pulliam. I go by he, him pronouns. And I represent as a co-founder of Echo VA Coalition. So when it comes to be new and relevant to what Sally provided very thoroughly, HRV criminalization and why it's a very important issue for the Black communities and Black people living with HIV is because HIV criminalization, after what Sally described, the, the federal, federal law to get grant funding, it was then used to be a tool of systemic racism towards Black communities at a level that has exacerbated to really, really like crazy amount of different incarceration rates for Black communities, specifically in the Southern United States. Yes, HIV criminalization exists in other regions of the United States, but we see higher rates of incarceration of Black folks, specifically when we get into the like actual granular demographic data, we are seeing more Black women of trans or gender diverse experience. We are seeing more Black men and Black cisgender women that are criminalized at higher rates than their other racial counterparts. And that is the real truth of why this is such a pivotal issue around a, um, the Black communities in this conversation of HIV criminalization awareness. And that's what I wanted to add to that, just to be new and relevant. And I'll pass it to Ernest if Ernest has any additional elements to add to this particular question. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and the only thing I want to add, of course, you know, this is a term used to describe laws that criminalize or, you know, create penalties for people living with HIV. And as was said by um, Dr. Pulliam, you know, it is true that, of course, HIV affects the majority of the Black population in the South. And, of course, we have more uh, rates of Black young men, women are just amongst the Black race that is incarcerated. So yes, this is very, very, very important and very important in the state of South Carolina just because, you know, there is no law to decriminalize it. You know, I've had um, friends and, you know, you know, family that have, you know, simply gone to jail for the simple fact of, you know, being infected with HIV. So I just wanted to add that to what was said previously. Oh, thank y'all so much. You know, what's really important as far as what was said so far is the uh, focus on systemic racism. And if we don't talk about systemic racism, then it, it's only a half of the conversation, right? Um, it just looks like, oh, well, Black people are criminal or, or Black folks are sexually deviant or all of these mm -hmm. things. And it's not getting to the point that it's the racism that's targeting you know, Black people, especially Black uh, TGNC folks, especially Black trans women. And this gets on to the next question. And I'm going to start with Ms. Thomas, but please, anyone else, how does this issue impact testing, disclosure, and access to treatment? You talked about how these laws actually play out. How does that impact these things? Yeah, so... Um... HIV composition deters testing, deters disclosure, and also prevents access to treatment. Um, Black folks are already over-policed, over-surveilled, and under-resourced, um, especially when it comes to health care, health equity. Um, having HIV criminal laws on books discourages folks from testing because the law is essentially saying that if you know your status, you can be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. um, and also being that we are, uh, as a race, um, over-policed, there are also some laws that have like a first responder component to them where you can be criminalized for behavior. If you're living with HIV, you can be criminalized for behavior that poses zero risk um, of transmission, like spitting or biting. And these are laws that are still in the books. Um, and if we're saying that we are over-policed, that means that people living with HIV, Black people living with HIV, are at a higher risk of um, being put in these situations as well. Um, 
also want to say that disclosure is hard to prove. And if we're talking about systemic racism, black, black people are not trusted. Black people are not thought of to be telling the truth. And if you can't prove that there was disclosure, um, you're automatically put in a situation when you could have, your partner could have known, you could have had conversations, you could have gone to doctors together, but it's up, if it's up to the word of black people, um, oftentimes it's just, we're not taken for uh, being uh, truthful. And I think that there's no way, there's no way for um, disclosure to really be proven unless you have like a contract or something. You shouldn't be, have to be put in situations where you need to write something down just to have a sexual or intimate relationship with someone. Um, but yeah, ultimately HIV criminalization creates stigma and stigma means that people will not get tested, people will not want to disclose. Um, disclosure can also lead to uh, instances of domestic violence or intimate partner violence. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why um, HIV criminalization puts Black people and Black women and Black trans women in a position um, to be harmed either by other partners or the state. Thank you for pointing out the emphasis um, on intimate partner violence and the way that people living with HIV are actually prone to violence because the construct is people living with HIV are the perpetrators of violence. When studies show it's actually being with HIV is an indicator of violence happening to you. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, I'm going to switch just because the internet is internetting. <laughs> so one of our guests um, is going to make its way back. So this is for, I'm going to start with Mr. Ernest. Mm -hmm. What are some of the common misconceptions about HIV criminalization and how have these misconceptions impeded the progress that all of us know is so desperately needed? Yeah, I think some of the common misconceptions uh, for a lot of folks is how they feel that they can acquire HIV. Some folks say they can get it from biting, spitting, oral sex. Uh, and we know there's been plenty of studies. We know that there's a very, very rare chance that you can get HIV from these particular you know, modes of transmission. Um, and with that lack of knowledge, uh, far as um, law enforcement, or even just individuals in general, if they feel like, okay, this person may uh, have HIV, they spit on me, they bit me, then, you know, they can run with that and say, hey, now you have exposed me to HIV, which we know is not right. But just because folks know that those books, those criminalizing uh, laws are on the books, folks say, hey, they did this to me. I'm not even, just because I know, or I think I know they said this, I'm going to go ahead and try to pursue whatever kind of criminal um, uh, acts against that particular person. And I think that's just, it's just unfair. But, you know, those are some of the, you know, the stereotypes and, and the stigma is just so real, no matter what, you know, folks may not test. So, you know, we, you know, Sally talked about people not testing. It's because, of these things. They don't want to say now that I'm positive, I have to, you know, disclose, you know, and that's where folks feel like, you know, if I don't know, then if I'm not in trouble because I don't know, so that would deter them from coming in for testing. But it's some of the very small things as far as, you know, spitting, I mean, sitting on the toilet. I mean, it's just crazy that we still have those type of statements, but they are. Thank you. And if folks want to add anything about these common um, misconceptions. I can add a few things. Um, so one of the common misconceptions that um, I thought of was like how people feel about decriminalization. Like if we take these laws off the books, then there's no recourse for people who have 
intentionally transmitted HIV. Mm -hmm. um, I think the common misconception there is that intentional <laughs> HIV transmission is very, very, very uncommon. Um, in most cases, HIV conversation doesn't involve intent to transmit, and you don't need to actually transmit um, to be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. And in, there's also many cases in which a defense such as PrEP or con condom use or ART are not considered either. Um, there are also statutes in that are specifically criminalizing HIV um, where there could be general STD um, laws. So it's a specific target at people living with HIV. Mm -hmm. um, I think another misconception is that if like around criminalization is that it won't increase testing or disclosure mm -hmm. um, deal with HIV. And there's a fear of discrimination and that is what's deterring folks from getting tested and from disclosing their status if they are aware. And the criminalization of HIV just continues to heighten that stigma. Um, so in decriminalizing, uh, we would be able to increase testing and increase um, disclosure because people won't feel like they'll be discriminated against or have a fear of, like I said, violence um, if they are aware of their status. Yeah. And just to add to that, Sally, you, you made me think back to, you know, the times when I would have to say, hey, I need to provide this result to the family you know and after we give the result we say of course you know you're going to be fine you're going to live a long time but then we also had to say but you know now that you are positive you have to make sure you tell all your partners because of this law and i can just see the look on their faces to say okay now i'm dealing with this but now i also got to deal with the fact that now i got to disclose to everybody so it's like it will be so good if it's not there but that's one less thing that's added on as a burden and a stress for someone so and Mandy, so I wanted to add a piece around because equity, health equity and HIV equity is one thing that I work on on a daily and equity will never be realized until we actually deconstruct the systems that exist currently in our healthcare system in the U.S. and other countries globally. One of the barriers of that access, that is an immediate one. Mm -hmm. inclusion another immediate one these systems go back well beyond our time on this earth it goes beyond our ancestors time on this earth and they're antiquated and they don't want to be deconstructed and until we really get to that core equity in a sense of hiv public health health in general can't be realized especially by black communities. That's the Black LGBTQ plus community. That's Black women. And it's the Black people living with HIV communities across this nation. And I also wanted to just impede on those listening. How can we start that conversation of deconstruction, deconstructing the existing system that is rooted in systemic racism, rooted in the fact that they don't trust Black patients in the healthcare system or strata, rooted in the fact that Black women have zero voice most of the time in their maternal care or prenatal care. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we lose so many individuals from the Black community due to HIV or AIDS-related illnesses that could have been prevented if they were provided and retained into care throughout their time of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the perfect segue. So uh, Dr. Pulliam, I want to stay with you. And uh, Dr. Graham, um, welcome back. So thank you for that segue. Given that we're in 2024, <clears throat> that there have been leaps and bounds, you know, in the evolution of treatment. Like this morning, I was talking to a friend who's getting a long-standing injectable for their HIV medication. That's where we are. Given that, what are some of the reasons in your expert, you know, uh, thoughts on this, that these laws have also failed to evolve with the times? I'm going to start with a Dr. Pulliam, and then I'm going to go to a Dr. Graham. Thank you, Mandisa. You know, honestly, 
it goes really just back to what I said. These laws are rooted. They they were supposed to these laws in the states in the U.S. simply to get funding from the federal government. The mm -hmm. fact that the federal government thought that it was OK to criminalize a public health matter that was really at the time being researched and had really a lot of unknowns to it was already problematic from the beginning. Right. And then once things had progressed, the federal government just allowed these states to continue these laws on. So it's almost like the federal government, it was, it, it was, and I'm a previous federal government employee, it was our fault that, that these laws even existed. And it was our fault for not coming back to the table to like the National Governors Association that, you know, White House invites and has meetings with, et cetera, to say, you know, those HIV criminalization laws, we need to get rid of those. So what can we do to help and what can we do to assist? Because they're just messing up the HIV crisis that we're having at the moment. And we will continue to have if we don't change it. The fact that that did not happen showcases a lot of errors in our system. And the reason HRV crim laws continuously are just in their own antiquated stature in like the late 1980s and not evolved with all the advancement of treatment and technologies, whether it's prevention care or retention into care, and some of the strategies around those elements is mainly because the folks that the folks that administer these laws at the state level, governors, their state health commissioners, or however that is elected or selected for the state on a legal basis, want those laws to continue. And so it is it is the call to action to members that are watching this particular um, conversation and aware of HIV is not a crime awareness day to really say, how do we act? And I know we'll get to that in a conversation, but that is the place that we are at now because the Fed, the federal government has actually acknowledged their issue, right? And so thankfully with former um, Office of National AIDS Policy Director Harold Phillips, who really announced and showcased that, that harm that was done to the, the national community, those living with HIV, et cetera, it's now the time for us at the local level to act towards our states to get these uh, laws either modernized or completely repealed. And I'll stop there and hand it over to Dr. Graham. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. Uh, I, my name is Barney Graham. Uh, I'm debt director of the David Satcher Global Health Equity Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. And I've spent my career either in an academic institution at Vanderbilt for the first 20 years and then in the federal government at the Vaccine Research Center for another 20 years. And so I've been involved in treating AIDS patients since 1982. The first 14 years of my infectious disease career, uh, nobody survived HIV. Everyone died. And <clears throat> so HIV started out with a stigma uh, because people were afraid. And, and that fear is what leads medical problems to become political problems. And, and now that we have treatment, very effective treatment since 1996, um, people with HIV can live virtually normal lives. And, and if we stigmatize them or criminalize them, it will make people avoid getting diagnosed. It will make people avoid the medical care system and it will perpetuate the problem. So it's, it's both medically wrong and it's morally wrong because people who are People with a medical problem, um, it's medically wrong because it's contrary to the Hippocratic Oath of treating all people equally. And it's morally wrong because people who have an illness caused by a viral disease had no, uh, you know, you can't blame people for being infected. And, and after a three years of a global pandemic with a virus that nobody could stop, we should all know that a virus infection doesn't observe laws or borders or legislation or any other thing. It's a virus infection. 
Viruses don't respect any of that. So the idea that we are still stigmatizing people with HIV who can be effectively treated is counterproductive. It's, it's harmful to all of us, not, not just the person involved. It's harmful to society. It's harmful to public health. And it's harmful just to our overall well-being as a, as a country and a, as a world. Oh, thank y'all so, so much. I'm just thinking of all of these gems that I am getting. Um, I'm glad that it is recorded. Um, and I hope that the viewers are taking notes because a theme of this is so clear. We don't solve a public health issue with incarceration. Because guess what? If we could have solved it, it would have been solved with all of the incarceration of people living with HIV. And so the fact that, you know, there's still an, an epidemic should be the biggest proof that incarceration is the opposite of the answer. But sticking with that, um, I'm going to stay with uh, Dr. Graham and then I'm going to open it up. And like, you know, you know, with you, Dr. Graham, like all of your years of experience, oh, um, well, you know, life is, is how it is. I'm going to transition us and then I'm going to come back to this. Currently, you know, there are more than 25 states that have um, explicit HIV criminal laws and several states have sentence enhancements, mm -hmm. you know, um, Currently, the federal government has an interest in this, you know, with the December 1st letter from the Department of Justice in which they found that Tennessee is violating the Americans with a Disabilities Act by holding people living with HIV who are accused of prostitution to a very different standard than people not living with HIV who are accused of prostitution. Mm -hmm. But as we said, all of these are carceral responses. Mm -hmm. Given how costly it is to arrest someone, to try them, and then to incarcerate them, what are some other things that our states could actually do with that money? I'd like to start this only because it's going to be quick and I'm going to shoot it right to uh, Ernest. If we think about what has happened in the past few years around cannabis and marijuana legislation and allowing for those who were brought on and charged for minor uh, possession of marijuana and cannabis and how now in 2024, some of those state legislators are converting those funds that have been saved, honestly. Right. Because they changed the law so that minor possession is no longer criminalized. Right. That money is now going to helping schools or to, you know, provide some educational benefit to maybe those who are incarcerated or providing alternatives to incarceration, whether it's a mental, psychological workforce development. And I'm only speaking for the context of Virginia. That sort of money, those tax dollars are resourced to a different budget line item, right? And when it's a, a, a surplus of funding, they can then put it towards alternatives that avoid just causal responses. Because until we really take an alternative justice approach on these elements, all we're going to do is see our numbers be the highest in the world, highest in the globe of incarcerated individuals on a yearly basis. Over to you, Ernest, for this one. Yeah. And listen, Dr. Plum, I want to add, you know, as an advocate, as far as like testing, let's educate the folks. Let's teach the folks about PrEP. Let's teach the folks that, you know, there are ways to, you know, combat even acquiring HIV. Let's, you know, get the black folks that come into the phone set up. They're fearful of medical providers. OK, so we need to have some kind of way to open up some dialogue, spend this money on doing some community uh, forums, bringing some folk in to start educating folks about, hey, listen, HIV is not something with a big target on your back. There's ways to prevent it. And there's ways that we can redirect this money rather than paying this to incarcerate folks. You know, here in South Carolina, they incarcerate folks at one time. You could go in there with a minor infraction. 
which you simply gone in for shoplifting where you are at a level three facility with murderers and killers and everybody in the same type of dorm where you could not get any extra. Um, there were not a lot of extra programs for you not to think about, OK, I'm going to get out. I'm going to come back and do the same thing. Because a lot of those folks did that. They got out because that's all they knew. They felt like this is my community. This is what I know. They didn't know how to do anything else as far as rehabilitating. So they came back and then it was like, OK, so they figure the folks and, you know, the ones who the powers to be assume that, oh, OK, so this is working because they went out and committed something else. That's only because you did arm them and gear them and get them prepared. So when they walked out, they didn't have that, that they had other things to look for. So redirect this money into educating, coming up with some different programs. That's going to be a benefit. Let's try to reduce the stigma. You know, um, it's it's like we know it. We in the field. We say it. We say it. And then you go to folks and they can say the smallest thing. How folks still mention, oh, this person has AIDS. Who, I mean, that's just somebody that clearly just needs to be educated. And I tell folks all the time, no education until it affects your family. And pals, then they think a little differently, like, oh, well, it's not this, you know, then you have these, oh, we shouldn't have to do that for it to be the font that, you know, lawmakers and everything for it to touch their family. They say, now I want to move and do some stuff now. You know, we need you to move and do some things prior to that. So if it does happen to your family, you know, your family's going to be taken care of because you got things off the book that wouldn't, you know, so use that money to educate folks and, you know, put it in some better programs. I definitely agree. I'll add a small piece. Um, I think that we have to put funding toward fixing our communities and building up our communities. Mm -hmm. um, Black people face higher rates of homelessness, houselessness, um, higher rates of unemployment, higher rates of food insecurity. Um, if we are putting resources back into our communities to build up our communities, then we're ultimately saying that um, we're going to lower rates of HIV transmission. Um, we're going to be able to keep Black folks out of prison. Um, if you don't have the basic necessities to live, um, then you're opening yourself up involuntarily just based on how society um, maneuvers with Black folks in Black communities, um, open yourself up to um, the possibilities of uh, facing a lot of different disparities that don't necessarily happen in other communities. I think um, also to what Dr. Pulliam said, um, the, the cannabis laws, um, in the end, the money is being put back into the hands of the people who were incarcerated. And mm -hmm. I feel like that would be a very important thing to do if um, HIV was decriminalized. I think that uh, money should be put back into the pockets of the people who have been subjected to um, HIV criminalization. Mm -hmm. And that's in the, in the purpose of uh, building up HIV awareness and HIV um, programs that will uh, make sure that we are actually doing something effective to end the epidemic. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank y'all so, so much. Um, and related to this and bringing in um, some of the things that uh, Dr. Graham said earlier, um, uh, Dr. Graham, I want to actually start with you. But and then I want to open it up to others. In what ways can the state, meaning both the federal government and the 50 states and the many agencies, how can they be more driven to actually follow the science? You know, as we said earlier, almost all of these laws, you know, don't require actual transmission and intent to transmit or that you engage in activities that can even result in transmission. So please answer as far as what can they, you know, be done to drive them to actually follow the science.
One of the problems I think that's happening <clears throat> in general for HIV is that people have gotten used to it and, and people are uh, less interested in funding, not, not just for care, but for research and science. Uh, we have really good treatments and even long acting drugs that can be injected every uh, you know, month and all the way up to six months, but uh, we don't have a vaccine yet. So there's still actually a lot of work still to do on HIV. And, and so one problem is that uh, people have gotten used to the background noise of HIV and they, they are not giving it as much attention as it, it, as it still deserves. Secondly, I think on the front end, we just have to do a better job at educating both the community and the legislators about you know, how HIV treatment and science and knowledge has changed over the years. But on the back end, I think there is also a need to um, uh, try to dismantle the incarceration engine that's not only working for HIV, but it's happening in general mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's feeding the privately managed prison system that is driven to incarcerate, mm -hmm. especially people from underrepresented minorities and and uh, poor people. And so this, I think this problem has to be addressed both in a medical way, in an educational way, in an advocacy way, but also on the back end to try to dismantle this system we have in this country of incarcerating poor people. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Dr. Graham. Um, is there anything else that folks want to add as far as this question? I have uh, just a moment. One thing that is just killing me in my head right now, and it's the fact that I totally agree of, of more education to legislators, but I also know around the internal biases and the microaggressions that systemically are driven within majority of these legislators that come in and exude into their work and how they appropriate what exists such as HIV criminalization laws. Until that's dismantled, again, following the science is a second thought or an afterthought because at the real sense of it, if they were already following the science and then doing this rights based approaches, we wouldn't even be having this conversation nor wouldn't would need this particular awareness day, right? And I just want to center that because at the real root of it is that people come in with their own internal things that horrifically can change the picture or change the image of what should be done based on being a sworn in health commissioner for the state of X, Y, Z. And mm -hmm. those things is the reason why we are still having this battle, having this argument and having these conversations. Sorry about that, Ernest. Go ahead. My bad. No, you fine. That is so true, though. And a lot of things are these legislators, they bring their own bias. I don't like it. I don't support it. So then I'm going to hold my foot down on as long as I can. They know the science. They see it. They see U equals U. They see what PrEP does. They see, you know, what all these advancements and how these folks are living a very long life. Why can't you just say, OK, I'm going to stop thinking about my own personal bias and I'm going to think about the better of the country of the folks that I know that I serve besides my personal thing. But we got too many folks. And I think a lot of folks have been in there too long that need to leave. We need to get some young, fresh faces in there that think a little differently. Then, you know, we can probably change. But these folks in it, you know. We can talk to them and they seem excited and they say, okay, I got it. As soon as they walk off 10 minutes later, they're back to thinking that same thing. So we just got to keep our foots on their neck. But, you know, it's just because they have their own personal biases. They don't want to change it. And to clarify, when we say personal biases, you know, what we mean is they're racist and right. homophobic and transphobic, right? 
you know, because even though everyone on this call and hopefully folks in the audience know that HIV is something that happens across race, across gender, across mm -hmm. class, it's still associated as that gay thing, as that trans thing, as that black thing, as that poor black thing. And so that is the... Uh, um, is the bias that these folks have. And mm -hmm. that's why, even if it would help some of their constituents, if it hurts Black people, if it hurts LGBTQ people, these folks are willing to go for it. You know, what's that old expression? Cut off your nose in order to spite your face. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing. And I also want to pivot us some in terms of Folks on this call have really broken down what the issue is and how we got there. But mm -hmm. everyone on this um, in this panel are fighters. These are folks who are advocating day in, day out, and are and are bringing some of the most innovative strategies to address that. So, in this next section, I want to focus on the work that folks are doing to. Uh, decriminalize because folks have been busy you know you know dr pulliam you're in virginia in 2021 y'all had a major effort you know reform so what was that process like including what can you share for other advocates who are maybe earlier in that journey thank you mendisa yes and as a virginia native um that has transplanted to Georgia, I still on a day-to-day -day fight for people living with HIV throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia and my, uh, the ECHO VA coalition that was founded in 2018 was sort of spearheading an effort that was started years before that we just revitalized the energy and synergies to be able to execute what was needed to happen in the 2021 legislative session. So some of the background, how we built the coalition and how we started structuring what we call our strategic planning meeting and actual strategic plan was really after HIV is not a crime institute, which is a institute held every other year in various U.S. locations to really train and educate and things that need to be transferred to individuals who are going to be advocates and activists to work towards modernizing or repealing HIV laws by various uh, groups of uh, organizations throughout the nation. Um, and that was where this synergy began. The, the coalition framework and formation process took about a year and a half to really execute and nail down. We have support with strategic planning um, from various uh, national partners like the Positive Women's Network USA, as well as the CERO Project. And really at that time, it was people living with HIV in the room, uh, public health professionals in the room, advocates, um, people who were on PrEP and all these different diversities in one space, really learning about what this current infectious, infected sexual battery law is and what does it all entail and what we need to do to dismantle and get rid of it um, or the process towards that. So in 2019, after the strategic planning meeting, we really just started executing some of the outreach and gaining partners in the state of Virginia. And we worked with partners both in the rural setting and the urban setting and the suburban setting, because it's important when you're thinking around state advocacy, you can't just think about your own location. You have to think about the entire state. And everybody's context is different. Where in Southwest Virginia, the closest hospital was an hour away from most residential areas because it's such a rural setting. And you have to think that in Northern Virginia, you get about 10 options of hospitals or medical facilities in a 15 minute radius. So those differences really do matter. And making sure to connect with, you know, transgender and gender diverse peoples and the different organizations that exist there, sex workers, LGBTQ plus, those, those organizations that are doing matters around public health and those in their incarceration um, or incarceration. The carceral system in general was important to us because Virginia's incarceration rates and numbers have increased significantly over the past decade, majority of those being Black members of the community in the state of Virginia. And a lot of incarceration around HIV criminalization specifically had occurred a lot around Black women in Virginia. And so we were taking this on as a kind of multi-pronged approach. 
And so the outreach with partners, meeting with people at the Virginia Department of Health and some local health departments throughout the state, working with uh, those who are at the community-based organizational level and really starting stewarding our messages and our priorities and our pillars and approach of what we would do towards the session once we were able to really introduce the bill. Now that did not occur till 2021. And just briefly in 2020, we had to advocate around killing a bill that was not going to be fully inclusive and that was going to be limited in its uh, its effect or approach and impact. And so that process, we worked with our partners, both in state and nationally, to really help with killing um, a bill that was introduced in 2020. And in 2021, through the COVID-19 pandemic on a virtual only basis, we provided advocacy with our co um um, our co bill um, originators and was able to really steward the process um, by providing public comment, written comment, and a, and just as a, a method of advice um, for those listening and wanting to work in the state advocacy lane in this um, particular area, it's important to educate yourselves and your co coalition or members that want to do this work around the legislative system that exists in your state. In Virginia, it's called legislative info system or LIS. It could be called many other things in various states, but it's really important to know how to keyword search, really dissect bills, have someone that may have a legal expertise to kind of dissect what it's actually saying and what it means to the regular person. And then also just making sure that everyone understands because let, listen, everyone is all at a different level. We have different things on our minds. And so making sure people understand what's going on is just another most important element of any kind of advocacy. And lastly, when we got into this in the heat of it, I think it, it goes back to what Dr. Graham and what Ernest said earlier in this conversation. There was people who was so educated about this that just didn't care. Um, because they had their own personal opinions around HIV and the fact that um, a person living with HIV should do X, Y, Z, almost putting them on this like, you know, you are on this pedestal just because of your diagnosis and I want to track and follow you and make sure you align to the, to the law. And it's such a ridiculous sense, but that's how a lot of the legislators were thinking in this uh, debacle during the session. And so we were, you know, providing a little bit of psychosocial mental health support post session to our coalition members because it was very draining to to hear some of the things that legislators would say about HIV and about people living with HIV almost dismissing them and just being very ridicule like ridiculing to the fact that it brought people to tears it brought me to an emotional state and we had to really make sure to check on our folks during this time because it was a draining process and we're all virtual in our own uh, particular homes. We weren't together, we weren't in person. So it was a very difficult situation to be in. And so we wanted to ensure psychosocial and mental health support was provided. And then lastly, and I'll stop and pass it back is when we were successful, we knew that everything wasn't done. And so we unfortunately took one of the biggest hits when the sentencing around this particular law got a bit of a tension and had to go from a misdemeanor down back back to a fel felony level in a various conversations and committee hearings and such and we were heartbroken by that decision but we either was going to have to cut everything off or take that loss and keep on pushing towards the goal of full repeal and eliminating this law um, on the books of the commonwealth of virginia law so that's that's our goal that we want to get to we changed quite a significant amount modernizing in 2021, but we are still working and still advocating and still doing our outreach as we, as we, as much as we can over the next couple of years, not with knowledge that in the governor's governor race, our state flipped to Republican. And so a lot of it, these particular issues are under the hot seat. And so advocacy at this level is really, how can we garner more partners garner more numbers, and be ready for when the time comes to be at the forefront of the battlefield. Thank you, Mendisa. Oh, thank you so much, like, for sharing a firsthand perspective of um, this as a marathon, right? You know, it's not a sprint. 
uh, but I want to turn it to Ernest, to Sally, Dr. Graham, if y'all have other things, you know, to add as far as this first part of what is this process like? What would you like to impart to other advocates who are maybe just starting this journey or who need some encouragement on this journey? Yeah, I'll, I'll say something for the advocates who are just starting on a journey. Um, I've been doing like the snail's pace, you know, by myself. So having this great opportunity with uh, HNPT, HNP to be an advocate, it's taught me like, okay, now there's some bad things you got to learn. You got to learn the, you can be passionate and be ready to go and speak. But at the same time, you need, there's some things that you need to learn. You're like, okay, now what's going to be my etiquette when I go to see these folks? Um, I need to know who I need to hit. I just can't just blankly go in. So you need to do your research, find out who you need to hit, get you a team of folks that's going to be there for you. Just like, you know, Dr. Plum, so you may get some of that backlash and some of that, you know, file talk or whatever. Have you a good support system to say, hey, they may have said this, but guess what? We still going to push forward and do what we need to do. And we're not going to take a half step. You got to go for what you said you want. So I'm learning through this process to be steadfast and say, hey, there's a goal. And I need to work my way through however I need to maneuver. And I know it may not happen in six months, seven months, but at the same time, I just need to stay vigilant to make it happen and keep putting myself in the right um, spaces so that I can either increase the knowledge and what I need to do or make sure that I'm learning who I need to put my hands on and talk to. And then I can share that with folks in the area that I know are like-minded and are trying to do the same thing. And just like Dr. Pullum said, you know, Positive, positive women's, you know, network. They're great. The Zero Project, they're all good. So they've all been able to put me in, you know, the right place. And, and you can't do it by yourself. You need, you know, it's great if you think that you can, but you are going to need some support. So, you know, reach out and gain as much knowledge as you want. And just, you know, there's never a dumb question. I never feel like, okay, I can't do it. I, you know, I came into this and said, I'm not quite sure. But then I thought about it. I said, I've been advocating and doing things for other things. Now I just need to shift my focus, you know? So we all advocate for something. Now we got to say, okay, now let me shift this thing and use some of those same advocacy skills I've been using. So. Thanks, Ernest. Um, mm -hmm. I'll add, um, Ernest, you are one of our great HMP advocates. I just want to say that the HMP Collective is a group of five organizations uh, that are led by and accountable to the communities that are most impacted by HIV criminalization. Um, some of the work that we do um, involves ensuring that people with HIV have a voice in this movement. I think oftentimes mm -hmm. we forget that it is integral to decriminalization, to awareness that we have folks who are most impacted in the room at all times. Um, Positive Women's Network is a member-led organization and something that we stand by and stand really firm on is you have to take a member, take a member with you. Um, and that is not to say take them somewhere physically, but pull all of your people up. Mm -hmm. Give the people the resources that they need to be advocating for themselves. Like mm -hmm. Ernest said, it's important to be working as a team and to um, create community and coalition um, and ensure that working in these coalitions um, is the work is being done in a way that centers mm -hmm. folks with lived experience and puts folks with lived experience at the forefront of the work that's being done. Um, so I would just like to add that. And I think that ultimately um, what we need to do um, to advance is, you know, never let go of the major goal, the main goal. Uh, but sometimes that means we have to take baby steps to get there. Mm -hmm. um, we're not just gonna automatically repeal every HIV criminalization law. Sometimes we have to modernize. Sometimes we have to take a baby step because like y'all are saying, like these legislators are coming into this with their own understanding or lack thereof. And they're not hearing 
um, the experiences of people with HIV. They're not hearing the science because they don't want to, not that they don't have access to it, it's because they don't want to. So I think that if we're able to continue to move in a forward progression on these things, then um, you just have to stay in the fight and um, maybe baby steps, but each baby step is a step forward, so. Yeah. Thank you. And Sally, just really quick, um, just thinking of your background, um, as an attorney, if you can speak, just thinking of the uh, DOJ findings in their recent lawsuit on the 15th, how important is it for the federal government mm -hmm. to insert itself in these state fights? Or is it important? <laughs> yeah, I think the, the federal government lays the, sets the tone. Um, for what states should do. So if there's any instance where the federal government could get involved in deciding um, what a state is doing, whether what a state is doing is correct or uh, beneficial, I think that it matters. I think we've had uh, so, so much has come out of our federal agencies that has said that um, we should be letting go of HIV criminalization laws. Mm -hmm. So if the DOJ needs to get involved um, to encourage states to get rid of HIV criminalization, I think that's the best thing um, that can be done because it's been 40 years, almost 40 years, and these laws are still in the book. So sometimes it comes to a point where something more has to be done. And I think that the federal government does have a major influence on how states will maneuver moving forward. So mm -hmm. I think that, yes, it's, it's definitely something that has to continue to happen um, because I do think that the federal government is under the understanding um, that HIV criminalization has to end. Y'all, this could be a whole conference, but mm -hmm. my hope is that this hour has, has really encouraged you and has sparked something as far as to get more involved if you're already involved or just new strategies in this fight. So we're at the end. I'm going to ask everyone very briefly just to share one final thought of something that you didn't share already. Very brief, 30 seconds each if possible. I'm going to start with Ernest. All right. So what I will share, you know, briefly is start wherever you feel like you need to start. If you feel like I need to start as if I'm crawling, crawl, you know. But as you crawl, you always have somebody that you have a parent or somebody that's going to guide you and teach you that next step to walk. So as you crawl and get with somebody that's going to be able to help you get up and start walking into some of these spaces and being, you know, that authenticated self that you are being able to voice yourself. So put yourselves in any kind of situation where you can learn how to be an advocate, but just know deep down, we all have an advocating spirit in us because we advocate for things that we want. And now we just have to learn how to, and, and this, nurture that thing so that it can be used in this, you know, to help decriminalize HIV. Thank you. Dr. Graham, any last thoughts? Yes, you've heard a lot about the things that people are doing in the current time, in the, in the present. Oh, well, hopefully um, he can join back. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Apulliam, if you could share any last thoughts. Absolutely. And and thanks for, again, and having me and my esteemed panelists and moderator today. I think one thing that I want to address as a closing statement is really know that this, this particular issue of HIV criminalization is something that's not only just in the U.S., but it's also global. And as mm -hmm. much as we, you know, People living with HIV that travel across state lines have to have this fear, this lingering fear because of these laws. And then it goes beyond when they travel to other countries where they may 
also have that same fear, that same issue. And until we really work on dismantling HIV criminalization from the root, from the U.S. and the global countries that it is still it still exists in, we will continue to fight. And if you're ready to join, let's all get together and let's fight together. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Graham? I don't know if you heard my last comment because I got knocked off again, but um, the point was that there needs to be short-term, intermediate, and long-term strategies. And ultimately, until we diversify the leadership, not just uh, in public health and science and medicine, but in, in the legislature, um, it, it's going to be hard to reverse some of these decisions that are discriminatory. Thank you so much. And Sally, please close us out. Thank you. And thank you to all of the panelists. I feel like this is a, has been an amazing conversation, um, much needed. Um, something I would like to share is that ultimately we have to make sure that Black people, Black trans people, Black LGBTQ folks are mm -hmm. centered in all of the work that we do. Um, we are the people who are most impacted by the HIV epidemic, by the policing system, by the family policing system. And if we can continue to, as a people, um, bring each other together, and as I said before, pull our other folks up, or take a member, as I said, um, I think that we'll be able to do um, all the work that needs to be done to mm -hmm. actually end HIV criminalization for good. Thank y'all so, so much. Uh, thank you to the Morehouse School of Medicine for all the folks who made this possible. And as we all say, when we fight, we win. So let's keep on fighting, y'all. That's right. Thank you. That's right. Thank you all for uh, joining us today for this noteworthy conversation and a huge appreciation to our awesome moderator, Ms. Mandy Samore, and also our panelists, Drs. Graham, Drs. Pulliam, Ms. Sally Thomas, and also Mr. Ernest Brown. We certainly honor you all uh, for not only lending your expertise today, but the daily work you continue to conduct on the ground to ensure equity remains at the forefront of these discussions, especially for our individuals, our Black community, our people that are living with HIV. I also like to acknowledge our supporter and also our funder, Gilead Sciences, for allowing us to continue these conversations in these different spaces and also for assisting us with implementing um, strategies, creative strategies to advance this work that we are conducting on behalf of our community members. Uh, please feel free to join in the fight with us. We need all of the help that we can get in making sure that uh, people, will live, people living with HIV receive the equity and the justice that they very well deserve. You can uh, join in with us at our website, and it is saturinstitute.org. Also, don't forget to like and share um, our social media pages. We have a YouTube page, a Facebook page, an Instagram, Instagram page, and also LinkedIn. Again, thank you all. We look forward to being able to provide more discussions and also creative strategies to address the structural barriers that are impacting our communities. Thank you. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.